Hello everybody, Cantonese Cat here. I'm going to do a little bit something a little bit different here. I'm not going to talk about technical analysis in the sense of trying to predict the price action of a stock or crypto. I just want to show you what I think about money in general and how I think about things. And I also want to show you what um, the past is showing, what cycles could, could mean, and when people show you a fractal, they're trying to scare you. I want you to kind of put things into context here a little bit. Right. So first of all, this is a S&P 500 index chart or the SP, uh, SPX. Each of these candles here represent a six month period. You are seeing the Bollinger Band here and you see the basis here, which the base is going to be a 20 moving period, right? So 20 times six is a 120 month period or is a 10 year moving average, right? Over here is just a bunch of crap. Like none of this really matters in terms of what you're thinking now. The world is completely different then than it is now, especially the U.S. At this particular time, U.S. really wasn't anything um, in terms of world economy. Like it didn't really have that big of an influence. It was just kind of doing its own thing in its own continent. There are a couple of things. First of all, there is a little bit of growth over time, right? But the growth has been really, really slow. You know, the growth does come because we did have the Industrial Revolution. There is an immense increase in productivity, so there is going to be growth involved. However, there's going to be a, a few problems here. First of all, the um, the money doesn't necessarily flow into the stock market at that particular time, and uh, so it's not really a good reflection of the economy, right? Secondly, um, they the U.S. Done, it, it doesn't really have any true like inflow of capitals like you know nobody's really from a different country really like put, pouring a bunch of money into the u.s and trying to invest like it's not like what it is now right and then thirdly i think we still kind of work a little bit in the world of scarcity instead of um, thinking about abundance the whole world works on colonialism right like you, you everybody is trying to get a piece of the pie and the pie is limited so this is a completely different world it is now, and I'm not even going to spend too much time here. Now, around this time is when the first world conflict happened. And unfortunately, when you have a world conflict, what ends up happening is that you're going to, unfortunately, you're going to end up having substantial amount of people who suffered and died from the process. And everybody is going to be pushed to the brink. And when that happens, it is extremely tragic to what happens to human when that happens. Unfortunately, it these things did happen, and I'm not trying to justify it in any way at all. But the truth is, when people are being pushed to bring innovation happens, and this is around the time when you really start to have a lot of you know vehicles, a lot of um, improvement in mechanics radio you know there's been a lot of tremendous progress that are being built here and people communicate with each other better you know because they have all these tools right now when that happens you're going to have an increase of growth you're going to have an increase of narrative and people are going to you know want to get their hands on these goods and there is starting to be abundance because productivity has increased and because of that there's enough goods to support the idea of bringing in additional credit, right? And this is really around the time when credit really started. When you start to have credit, that's great, right? Because if you want goods, well, you, you can have a bunch of IOUs and you're allowed to have goods and you can keep leveraging, you can keep leveraging. And when you have a bunch of credit, when you have a bunch of money kind of floating around because credit is also a form of money, you're going to have more and more and more leverage and people are going to want to put their money somewhere. They started going to the stock market around the 1920s. And as it goes up, it just keeps going up, right? That's just kind of how things are sometimes. Things get a little bit irrational. The amount of credit around out there is not really justifiable by the amount of goods there coming up. Productivity really couldn't catch up, so you end up having a crash, right? And the crash is basically a mean reversion. It probably overdives a little bit, but eventually it did end up having growth during this period. It just ended up having a lot of mean reversion, a lot of noise. That really wasn't um, 
anything surprising because overall from here period here to the period over here things grew and you did have increase in productivity right but this is really the first time the u.s stock market has seen anything like this it's still a little bit isolated at that time there really still wasn't any like world money inflow coming into the market to trying to save it in addition to all that we also didn't really have the capability of printing money to fight the deflation that happened here and it is extremely unfortunate um, because we just don't have any of the systems they have in place now back then bank runs were rampant there really wasn't any fdic insurance there was a bunch of panic the government really wasn't able to have any kind of narrative to control. They even they actually didn't even really know what to do. They're trying to figure out economics at that time, right? Because it was such a rapidly changing world. Eventually, they're able to figure it out. They put in FDIC insurance. Eventually, they're able to figure it out because when the FDR came in 1933, he stopped gold standard. And the U.S. became a quasi gold standard um, in 1935. They started having government bonds because the government wants to spend to try to spend their way out of the Great Depression. So they started having government credit and that became an asset class. And that really is, you know, starting to change the U.S. economy at that point. Now, the key thing is, around here, you also started having a second world conflict, right? And what really jumpstarted the U.S. stock market is that we started exerting significant control over the, over the world policies and over the economy. We're probably at that point the most stable um, government, and the world has entrusted us with the US dollar as the world's reserve currency. And this really started happening after the second world conflict. In addition to that, because of the grave amount of human sacrifices that had happened, and one was even argue whether or not it was really truly sacrifice or if they just, you know, died from it for no reason. Human race were pushed to the brink once again, and there was a tremendous amount of innovation that happened, which includes cars, better cars. You know, they already had cars over here, but much better cars, television, radar, all kinds of good stuff, right? Everybody's just able to communicate with other people better. Their world has just drastically changed right around here. The economy productivity increases and because of the American dominance we're able to control currency and because we got off of gold standard we're able to print money in forms of credit in forms of um, bonds right with all of this you started having money kind of spooshing around and you actually at this time actually end up having products to kind of help back it up so the economy grew Money started getting printed, but because of deflationary forces, because there's actually increasing productivity, the economy grew. And up until around this point, right, right around here, around the 60s and 70s, it really started stalling. It was because even though the economy was growing, it, the money printing was actually happening faster than the productivity can catch up with. So guess what happens? The economy slows down and it shows. And there's really not much you can do about it because at some point you're going to end up having a mean reversion. And this is when cycles happen, right? A little bit too fast, too, too soon, you're going to end up having too much money out there and not enough products. Cause, so that's what happens around this time. What happens is inflation. Right. Inflation happens in addition to all that. It, it, it was it was so bad. I mean, like Nixon basically took us off of the gold standard and everybody was, you know, initially worried about what that means. But what eventually ended up happening was that actually set up for us to have 
unlimited amount of power in terms of paper money printing. Another thing that also happened around here is that, you know, pension really wasn't a thing anymore. And there was a start of 401k to really support retirement. Well, if people are relying on their 401ks to retire, and if their 401ks just goes flat, what are they going to do? Well, you have the capability of printing money. Politicians can, you know, have some influence over that. And you also want to keep people happy and prevent them from revolting, right? You don't want revolutions. You're going to keep them happy. So guess what you do? You're going to try to print as much money as possible. Well, there was a problem here during this time. They already had all the mechanisms set and they trying to print as much money as possible. But there is a problem here is because there's still inflation that was happening, right? With all of these products that are coming, there's a limited amount of energy that you get. Oil supply was just not keeping up with demand. And inflation happens. You doesn't matter how much money you print, and next thing you know, you just don't have enough products, right? Something drastic had happened around here to allow the economy to go up again. Some people think that Paul Volcker combated inflation because he raised rates. I would argue that he didn't do anything. I would argue that the cycle is going to happen anyway. And I would argue that there was a drastic force that happened here that has nothing to do with Paul Volcker. All he did was inflation high, raise rates, inflation going down, go down again. Like he didn't really do anything to really change the fundamental of economics. The Fed does nothing. They just follow. And the Fed does one thing is if they see deflationary forces that can print money, they're going to do it. And they're going to do it because they want you to be happy. They're going to do it because they want people who have money to invest to get richer. And they don't really care about the poor. Sorry, that's a little bit more social commentary than is necessary. But the whole idea is there's a big force that came and has nothing to do with Paul Volcker. The big force that came was China. They, they, came, they basically, flood, they, Deng Xiaoping came in the leader of China at that time, they opened up the economy and they flooded the economy with cheap products. And when they flood the economy with cheap products, everybody started doing well. Then because of this drastically tough time here, because there were energy crises, there was a lot of innovation that also happened that allowed us to extract energy in a better manner, that allowed us to be able to um, build the world economy better by having better fundamentals. And then China came in and helped us with inflation. The economy goes up again. When the economy goes up, there's increase in productivity. And right around this period of time, there's also something that came out that was very, very revolutionary, which is computers. And internet, you can also put that on there too. All these things really have increased globalization. That all these things have really increased productivity. They really changed the way that we live, right? So guess what? Deflationary forces, economy goes up, more money printing. The stock market goes up until it goes up too much. Like during this period of time, really right around like the nineties, around the late nineties. You can see it here too. If I just zoom in, you can see that these these candles it, down here. If it gets over the upper bull in Japan, you have a correction, right? It gets up for, up over the upper bull in Japan, you have a correction. This this correction over here was very brutal at the time, right? If you have, go over the upper bull in Japan, you're gonna have a correction, right? And here it seems to be more and more sustainable because they really stay inside of the the upper bull in Japan. They really go like crazy, right? But here for one, two, three, four, five, so for like five years in a row, you have price kind of closing outside of upper bull in Japan, just pushing all this stuff up, right? Do you have the innovation that goes along with it? Do you have the deflationary forces that goes along with it that allows you to have that? Maybe, 
right? But it was just going up too fast. Maybe the course was kind of like this, maybe, right? But it was just going too fast. Like this is getting a little bit of like irrationality here. The deflationary forces, the productivity was not there enough to sustain the amount of you know um, credit and the amount of leverage and the amount of money that's being printed out there. It just wasn't there, right? So guess what? You end up having a mean reversion when the bubble popped, right? It doesn't mean that these products are not real. It just means their valuation just wasn't. It, it's just completely out of the world, right? Eventually, productivity is going to catch up, and it did, right? Because all these products, computers, internet, telecommunication, they do drastically change our lives. Eventually, it catches up, right? But you're going to end up having about a lost decade or so here for it to catch up. First time it did it, you know, okay, so we're going to have, have it having a nice recovery up here. Great. No problem, right? Let's just keep printing money, right? Problem comes with this is this, right? There's a first part right here, which the stock market was super leveraged. And then there's a second part right here where housing was super leveraged. Housing was basically where all the money had, you know, flooded to around this period of time. And unfortunately, the economy is also you know, very heavily tied to housing too. So you end up having a stock market crash. You also end up having a housing crash. That also, you know, tank the economy. Also end up having um, another stock market crash. The economy just wasn't able to sustain this um, huge amount of money printing, a huge amount of growth, and huge amount of credit, and huge amount of asset pumping. Right. What happens at this particular period of time was pretty amazing. Before around here, it was risky. I mean, like, you know, if you lose everything, you lose everything. Banks weren't insured, there were bank runs, right? Something ridiculous has just happened here that I think people are not really taking into consideration. When bears came in and talk about how, oh, you know, like this is all, un, you know, unsustainable. There's like the national debt. There's all these things. We're going to crash again because, you know, it just looks like we're just kind of way too fast, way too far, way too fast. I, I don't know what to say about that because one big thing just happened. Like they basically just stopped banks from failing. They basically just say we're going to print the amount of money that's necessary to keep banks alive. Banks, or at least big banks, cannot fail. The amount of risk-taking behavior that this encourages, I, I don't even know what to say, right? If you're smart enough to catch up to that, you, you would be, you, you have made a ton of money over the last couple of decades. Like, you made a ton of money. And the mean reversion ended, right? It was a very, very tough time Companies got better, companies got smarter. Even Microsoft started being innovative again. Apple was being very innovative, right? Google started to became, you know, came out the pack here and became very innovative, right? Amazon also took advantage and, you know, basically all of these big companies that we know of, they grew the economy and they continue to grow the economy and they continue to push up. Innovation continue to happen. And it's now justifying the amount of money printing due to deflationary forces, right? Massive amount of products have been pushed up the market. Cell phones, you know, it, it, like tablets, you know, all kinds of things that are being pushed up here. Better, better watches are being pushed up here, right? In addition to that, you also have um, better softwares. You also have better uh, ways for us to do things. The productivity is skyrocketing. You have the genetic revolution that happened. And now you actually have drugs that can really make drastic changes to cancer. And things are keeping on happening, right? So it's currently the efficiency forces are potentially sustainable by the amount of money that they're printing. 
and the economy goes up. If you are thinking about when we are, I think we might be here. You know, we just went through a pretty drastic bear market, although it just looks like a bleep on the radar, really. But it looks like a bleep on the radar here and here, but we just experienced something extremely painful. Along the way here, as we go up, people are going to be very, very anxious. People are going to worry, right? What if we get a Great Depression again? What if we get another one of these, you know, inflationary thing that just sticks around forever? I mean, I don't see why you would think that because we continue to have increased productivity through time, right? What if we, you know, get the banks to fail again? Like, I, they, you, you don't have that narrative anymore. Banks can't fail. You have productivity. You have the next generation of narrative here. Price continues to stay within the upper bull in Japan. It's not getting way too overextended. That tells me that I don't think we're really necessarily in a bubble here at this time. We were a little bit of a bubble here because they printed too much money too fast, right? The economy didn't really grow in relations to how much money they're printing here at that time, right? So the the, the money went way outside upper bull in Japan. Guess what? You're going to have a correction down, and that's exactly what happened. But after you have a correction down, just like you, that, you did have here, what happens? You're going to keep riding up a bull in Japan because this is a very, very strong deflationary trend. We continue to have enough deflationary forces to allow us to print money and stock market keeps going up. I don't see a bubble. I, I, I don't see a bubble. If you look at psychoanalysis, you know, sure, you know, we, every single challenge that you get Matter of fact, I'd like, you know, I would actually argue that the challenge that we get over here from COVID actually have increased innovation. There are a lot of things that would otherwise not have happened that have happened after COVID. And matter of fact, it could actually help with the further, you know, deflationary forces, right? I, I think if you look at cycles, sure, would history repeat again? Sure, right? But in under different circumstances. If you're really looking at different cycles, Sure, we have a deflationary mean reversion here. We have a mean reversion here because as human, we tend to want to go too fast, too far, uh, too far, too fast, more than we can catch up, right? More than we can chew. Same thing here, right? Would the same thing happen again? Sure. How far along is it going to happen? I don't know. This lasted for about a good, you know, 20, 30 years. And this lasted for about a good uh, 20, 30 years. So... I mean, from here going up here, I mean, you've got like a good like 12, 13 years, you know, who knows, it could last for another 15 years, right? I don't know why we'll be screaming bubble because we're not running into things like that. And because the growth right now is actually a lot more exponential compared to when things were over here, and the government are also just a lot more incentivized to try to print money because of 401k, because they can. And because they're going to do it to save the financial world, no matter what it takes. They don't want people to have any revolution. They want control. And they're going to take advantage of the deflationary forces that are going to happen. They're going to keep printing money. What do you do to protect yourself? from them printing money because they're going to do it. Invest in the US stock market. Why not invest anywhere else? Because you know who's going to have the most US dollar? The US. You know why that is? Because we can print it. Nowhere else in the world can print US dollar. And the US dollar is still the world reserve, reserve money. Whenever the US wants to spend money, the world's paying for it. You want to make sure that you protect your money by letting it grow in the market. Because if you don't, they're going to dilute you. Because they can. Because of innovation, because of deflation. 
you want to invest. You might go through a bad period like we just went through, but the good period could last for longer do you, than you can imagine. If you have to err on the side of either being too bullish or too bearish, I would definitely choose to err on the side of being too bullish. I am done here. <laughs> This is a very unusual video for me to put out. I'm not an economist, I'm not a historian. I just wanted to share my thoughts. I want to see how well this video aged in 10 years, in 20 years, if YouTube is still a thing. Thank you for listening, bye.